Welcome to Logston Seminary and to Hardin Simmons University. We are so glad that you're here this evening for the 19th annual TB Maston Lecture Series. This uh, wonderful lectureship has uh, been an opportunity to bring the outstanding minds in the field of Christian ethics to our campus for lectures year in and year out. And again this year, we have a, a wonderful opportunity from hearing about one of the leaders in our country in a particularly important area of, of Christian ethics. We're so happy that Dr. Brian Bantam is here from Seattle Pacific, and he will be more formally introduced in just a bit. Logston has had a commitment to Christian ethics uh, from the beginning, and our relationship uh, to the TV Maston Foundation has been so important. And um, the heritage of Dr. Maston is something which we celebrate, but also provides a model from which we can learn. Thomas Buford Maston was uh, a a Christian ethicist, a, a Texas Baptist who was a prolific writer in uh, the middle part of the 20th century and the latter part of the 20th century. He went to uh, Yale, among other places, to study. He understood the complexities uh, and, and depths of uh, the area of ethics, but was able to translate that insight and scholarship into the kind of language that uh, average person in the pew, average individual in the corner could understand. He was also profoundly committed to scripture and his model is that of building ethics out of scripture. He was also a man of great humility and of, uh, of, of deep courage which gave him the fortitude in very difficult eras of the 60s and 70s and 80s to speak about some challenging issues. So in the heritage of the example of Dr. Maston, these lectures continue year in and year out in our desire to be ourselves ethicists who are learning to walk as Jesus walked, to quote the title of one of Dr. Maston's books. Here at uh, Logston, we want to be of uh, service to you. Uh, we have uh, guests here, and if we can be of help to you in any way, if, if we can visit with you about uh, the opportunity of theological education or of seminary studies, we'd love to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, in the foyer, there's a table that has a little bit of information about Logston on the table. And also, uh, there is a copy of a publication we uh, produce every spring called Window, and in that publication, Publication, we print lectures from the preceding year. And uh, the particular copy of window that's on the table is uh, presents the lectures from T.B. Maston last spring where Danny Carroll spoke about uh, the Bible and immigration. So if you're interested in that, feel free to pick up a copy and you'll have his complete lectures there and also some responses uh, from individuals. Uh, we want to welcome uh, some guests this evening. Uh, we are privileged that uh, representatives from each of the Texas Baptist Universities uh, who were able to come are here with us. Uh, they are young Maston scholars identified by their faculties as leaders in their area of study and interested in ethics. At the end of our program tonight, we will individually introduce them, but let me just ask them uh, to stand as a group here that we might recognize them, please. Thank you, thank you. We have uh, such a wonderful uh, connection to the T.B. Masson Foundation Board and uh, several representatives of the board are here. Uh, so if you're a member of the board now or have been in the past, would you please stand that we might acknowledge you. Thank you. We uh, have uh, some guests uh, from the community, some individuals from across uh, campus, from other Hardin Simmons uh, faculty and administrators here. Thank you so much for your participation uh, in this dialogue together as we think about some important topics. One of the things that uh, the T.B. Maston Foundation has done with Hardin Simmons is to establish uh, the Maston Chair of Christian Ethics. Those uh, agreements were made uh, 
20 years ago in uh, 1999. Dr. Bill Tillman held that position for a number of years. On his retirement, we engaged in a search, a national search, and as a result, uh, we were able to bring to our campus Dr. Miles Wernz as uh, the current TV Maston chair holder. Uh, Dr. Wernz has been here three years and has already contributed profoundly to our community uh, through his, his teaching and his wisdom, his encouragement, and his uh, prolific writing. And uh, Dr. Wernz is the one who has organized this event and brought all the pieces together. Uh, we are so grateful to you for all the work that you have done. And assisting him uh, in that task, taking care of all the details, is Laura Seaton, our administrative uh, assistant at Loxton. Thank you both uh, very much for your work. Dr. Wernz uh, now will come, uh, or in just a moment after a prayer, will come and introduce our speaker this year. Would you join me? Our gracious God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. And through Jesus Christ, we are called to imitate that one who is our model of becoming what you have made us to be, fully human, fully living up to that image within us, becoming what you imagine for us. As we listen tonight about words that guide us and challenge us and encourage us, open us up to the way in which your spirit would help more profoundly to create us in the image of Christ and to make us faithful servants as we relate to one another in love. We pray in Christ's name, amen. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'd like to go ahead and inv invite you in advance to tomorrow morning's follow-up to what you'll hear tonight. It'll be 9.30 in the University Chapel. So it is a real gift to have with us for tonight and tomorrow, Dr. Brian Bantam. Um, I've long been a reader and admirer of Dr. Bantam's work. I've taught his work in my classes. Um, those of you who have had me for the Christian Witness course, you've read selections from his work. Um, and so, it's nice to have him finally here uh, in person. Dr. Bansom uh, is a graduate of Houghton College, of Duke Divinity School, and of Duke University. He has been at Seattle Pacific University since 2009 where he teaches courses in the University Foundations program, in their theology major, as well as in Seattle Pacific uh, Seminary. His teaching and research focuses on the intersection of theology and identity, exploring how the claims of the Christian faith are illumined and challenged by the realities of race, ethnicity, and gender. His first book, Redeeming Mulatto, A Theology of Race and Christian Hybridity with Baylor Press in 2010, uh, received a number of uh, positive and glowing reviews, and it explores how mixed race identity illumines and how race shapes us, and reimagines, he reimagines Christian discipleship through Christ's body as both human and divine, a union of flesh and divinity that remakes the lives of disciples into a new kind of people, a holy mixture of flesh and spirit. His second book, The Death of Race, Building a New Christianity in a Racial World with Fortress Press in 2016, likewise offers the church new ways of reimagining the Christian life uh, with, with respect to our humanity, our fallenness, and Christ's work, all through the lens of race and racism. So, Dr. Bantam is a prolific writer and contributor. Uh, he and, he and uh, his wife Gail and their three children have been in Seattle for the last nine years. His wife, uh, Gail Song Bantam, is likewise a minister. Uh, so, I could go on and continue to talk about Dr. Bantam. It's a real privilege and a pleasure for him to be with us tonight, and I hope that we can uh, learn a lot from you tonight, Dr. Bantam. So, thank you for being with us. Good evening, everyone. How are you all today? Good. I've missed, I've missed being able to say um, y'all 
and have everybody kind of like just not blink an eye. Um, so I've been in Seattle for about nine years now, um, and everyone kind of turns their head a little bit when, when I talk about it, but it works out. It works out perfect. So say, hey, what's up, y'all? And you're like, yeah, what's up, y'all? <laughs> Um, well, it's indeed an honor and a privilege, privilege to, to be here. Um, I want to thank um, Dr. Wernz for the um, kind invitation um, and the honor to be with you all. I want to thank the Masson Fan Foundation for, um, for doing this and just to see a few of the names of previous lectures. It's certainly an honor um, to be counted among them. Um, for those of us who are scholars, we, we live lots of our lives um, reading books of other people who we always feel are much more famous than us and, and write words that we oftentimes just hope will get read. Um, and so to be invited into a space like this um, is truly an honor um, to be with you all. So the, the, my, the topic for tonight is this question of race and Christianity. Um, the title of my talk is The Disruptive Body, um, Christology for a Racial Raced World. The Disruptive Body, Christology for a Raced World. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why I'm using the word race in such a curious way. Um, but to first to for us to begin to think about this, I want us to begin to complicate the question of the body. Um, I've been struck this in the recent years, um, I don't think it's, it's controversial to say that America is in a state of flux. Um, that it is in a moment of both um, uh, where we are, are kind of seeing the legacies of, um, of our racism, um, in a sense kind of um, renewed, and we are seeing fundamental divisions of who we imagine ourselves to be and who we think we ought to be um, emerging. Um, and we are seeing differences in different ways of accounting for ourselves and the body and who we are um, in seemingly more and more fractious ways. And, and it's hard to imagine what a way forward looks like. But one of the things that I have been struck by in the midst of these conversations, um, difficult dialogues, is oftentimes the absence of a question of investigation in terms of what is the body anyway. What is it that we mean by race? What is it that we mean by gender? What is it that we mean by this bodied life that we're thinking about? And so what I want us to do tonight is begin to think about this question of the body. This, bo this question of the body in light of what does it mean to think about race? Um, how do we account for ourselves as raced people? Um, and what in the world does Jesus have to do with any of this? So to begin, I want to kind of offer, kind of give you a little bit of insight into a space that I'm walking into and, and the space that I've occupied in my own life um, and tell a little story when I was little. So um, I am a black mixed man. Uh, my father was black. My mother was white. Um, while it was technically legal, it was still strange. Um, and so I would walk through the mall with my mother um, and my little brother, who's two years younger than me, and I would always, inevitably, we would get a look or a series of looks that looked something like this. They would look at my mother, they would look at me, they would look at my brother, and they'd come back to my mother. And then they might, like, if they're really bold, they would, they would do it again just to like make sure that triangle was very well inscribed. And sometimes my mother would say something, sometimes she wouldn't. Um, and so we would get this over and over and over again. Um, one particular time I remember my, we were in Ocean City, Maryland at the beach and we just went for the day, we were driving home, but my mom was really tired. Um, so we just decided to get a little motel for the night. So she goes in, um, she's getting ready to get the motel, the little vacancy light is kind of flashing. Um, I start to get a little impatient, I'm, I'm six years old at this point. I follow her into the, into the hotel. And we get it again, the triangulation, my, the, the hotel keeper, the innkeeper, you know, they don't call them innkeepers anymore, right? The hotel owner um, looked, at, looked at my mother, looked at me, and then flipped the sign to no vacancy. And we had to keep driving that night. So the question now is, what is happening in these moments? What's happening in this kind of triangulation of bodies? What is the 
difference that they're seeing and why does that difference matter so much? And we might call that difference, we might classify that difference as race, a difference of race. My mother is white, I am not. My mother is a woman, I was not, right? But in those moments, there was a particular difference that mattered, right? Something about our skin. It wasn't even about the, the look of our face. If you put my mother and my face and you mash them up, there is an odd similarity. I have freckles, we have something in the eyes. There is a lot of similarities, but somehow there was a difference between my mother and I that mattered. A difference that was disruptive. A difference that kind of created a kind of problem in the eyes of the passerbys, in the eyes of the hotel owner. The question is, what is that difference, and why is it so powerful, and how does it, and why does it have so much power to render all of these other similarities and likenesses null and void? What's happening in this moment? Well, one of the things that we have to begin to understand is that the difference that mattered in these moments actually had very little to do with biology had very little to do with nature. Yes, my skin was darker than my mother's. Yes, my hair is curlier than my mom's. My skin is lighter than my father's, but I share my father's nose and lips. What is the difference that happens here? Well, part of what we begin, have to begin to account for when we think about the question of race is that race actually has nothing to do with your bodies. It has nothing to do with our bodies. It has everything to do with what one says about the body, about the discourse that emerges about why those differences matter, about which differences matter, and how those differences somehow indicate something deep and fundamental about my character, about my nature, about who I am and made in the image of God. In a very real way, what race has done is actually made us fundamentally blind to what it means for our bodies to somehow illumine and imagine what it means to be made in the image of God. Theologically speaking, we might say that we have lost the significance of difference. Now, in the midst of this, you might say, okay, Dr. Bannum, you're this, we're tracking with you. This is great. Colorblind. Let's do it. Let's just forget this whole race business, right? The only problem here is that like so many sins, the sin of racism is not the eradication of something, but it is a, the subtle distortion of something very true. The subtle distortion of something beautiful. And that is that in fact God made difference. That difference is fundamentally part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Because inside of God's own life, what is God but difference and likeness, right? The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Father and the Son are not the Spirit. Our God is triune. Three distinct, different persons, differentiated from themselves, and yet at the same time bound to one another. And yet each one of these persons is also like one another. Right? To give a fancy theological term, we might say they are homoousios with one another, of the same stuff. Right? So inside of God's own life, there is difference and there is likeness. Difference and likeness, right? So difference is not something to be eradicated, not something to be shamed, not something to lose. In fact, if we lose difference, we lose something of what it means to be made in the image of God. So what then do we do with difference? How do we account for it? What does it mean that this, how does this difference somehow draw us more deeply into what it means to be made in the image of God? Well, let's go back to this moment of creation. And specifically, these creatures that are made in the image of God. God says, let us make them in our image, male and female, let us make them. Right? And in the second story, we have Adam, who was made in this image, and notice that Adam is not good. Right? We can't, sometimes I really love like, kind of getting into arguments with patriarchal readings of the Bible because people say, God, man was the highest being, right? Well, women are kind of second. Right? I'm like, yeah, but actually men are the first thing that are kind of meh. Right? <laughs> Trees good, light good, stars good, fish good, roaches good, everything good. Men, eh, could be better. What's going on? Now, of course, I don't mean that I'm not, it's not to say that my body is not intrinsically good, but in essence, it's good, Adam's body is good, but it's not Imago Dei good. Right? 
What does it mean to be made Imago Dei? Imago Dei is not Imago Dei by itself. Imago Dei is not Imago Dei in the kind of isolation. So as long as Adam lays there in the Garden of Eden by himself, he cannot be image of God. He cannot share the likeness of God, right? It is only when God pulls something out of him, right? Where he has a likeness to it. It is of the same stuff. Homoousios with him, right? who can choose and love in the same way that he can choose and love, that he has some possibility of being like God. And yet at the same time, what is this likeness dependent on? It is dependent upon a difference. He wakes up to one who is not him, right? And here I think oftentimes we confuse the kind of qualifications of male and female as having some sort of deep spiritual significance. In essence, it's possible that male and female simply are visual significations of a difference, right? In essence, what it means, the maleness and femaleness are not kind of particular instantiations of what it means to be made in the image of God. Maleness and femaleness are simply visible representations that I am not you and you are not me. That I, somehow, if I'm going to live into what it means to be made in the image of God, I have to account for this one who is like me, but not quite like me. Who's different. Who has their own likes and desires and hopes and ways of enjoying the world. Likeness and difference. And yet, in the midst of that likeness and difference, what does God tell them, right? What does Adam exclaim when he wakes up? Who is this but bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? In the same way that they are taken out of the very ground of the earth, in the same way that they, God has breathed into every atom and fiber of their being, they are bound to God, they are bound to the ground, and they are bound to one another. So notice that what we have here is difference and likeness, but that difference is not a difference in and of itself. It's not a difference that is wholly independent. It is a difference that is wholly when it is oriented towards the other oriented towards the one who is not you, oriented towards the one who is of the same stuff but is not the same as you. So our differences are not ours to hold on to, they are ours to live into this other one in the same way that we live into God, in the same way that God lives into us. So difference and likeness are powerful notions of what it means to be made in the image of God. And so when we look out in this room, we see multiplicity. We see all kinds of difference. And we see differences both in taste, we see differences in physical features, we see difference in hopes and dreams and skills, and all of those things are a mago day. What it means to be made in the image of God and are all made to orient us and draw us more deeply into a life of God which can only be known through a life with one another. Now the question of course becomes, this all sounds great. What went wrong? Why do we not all, why are we not always bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and that's so good and you so good and I'm so great, right? What happened? Well, of course, we have the story of the fruit, right? And um, Adam and Eve's eyes are opened, and then they're naked, and they're ashamed. Right? In a very strange way, in the moment of eating the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they are now able to see something that they couldn't see before. And that seems a little strange, right? Because they could have seen, like, like, you see the same body, you see the same tree, you see the same fruit. Now all of a sudden they're looking at all of those very same things in ways that are profoundly different. The way that Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about this, he says that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a tree of judgment. That is to say, the ability to say what is good and what is not good, right? And part of the reason why God, why God did not want Adam and Eve to eat of this tree was because only God can know something if something is good in its kind of deepest depths in its being, right? Only God has the capacity to do that. Only God knows how to differentiate between these differences in such a way that he can determine who is and who isn't, right? And yet somehow Adam and Eve wanted this kind of possibility. And so what happens? They eat of the fruit, their eyes are opened, and all of a sudden they see one another, and now all of the difference that they see, they cannot account for. They don't know what's good. They don't know what's bad, right? 
Adam looks at Eve, and Eve looks at Adam, and they're like, mm, you're looking good. That's what I want to do to you. And then Adam looks at the way that Eve's looking at him, and he's like, don't look at me like that. I'm not a piece of meat. I'm not some fruit just here for your consumption. And Eve looks at the way that Adam's looking at her, and she's like, don't look at me. Like, I'm a human being. I'm, what happened to bone in my bone, flesh of my bone? And Adam's like, mmm, yeah, flesh of flesh. She's like, that's not what God meant. So what happens is in the midst of, and so in the midst of this recognition that they are not seeing for their, being seen for their personhood, right, but for their flesh, what do they do? They cover themselves. Because now they do not have the capacity to understand what these differences mean. They see the differences not as something to be beautiful, not something as beautiful, something as joined, something as oriented towards the other. They only see these differences in terms of how they can serve themselves, how they can be consumed, how they establish them over the other. And we see the consequence of this, right? Because God goes to Adam and Adam, and God says to Adam, Look, what happened? And what does Adam do? Adam says, that one that you gave me. Right? So at that moment, I'm sure God's thinking, like, whoa, what happened to bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? It's like, he, he wouldn't even let her name drop from his mouth. That one. Right? This thing you gave me. It's her fault. What happens? Now what we see is that Adam makes not only a differentiation in terms of what his body is for, right? He makes a differentiation of what her body is for. And what he makes a differentiation of her body in order to establish his own righteousness. So notice how this subtle shift in difference has happened. No longer do we see a difference that helps us to understand ourselves more deeply by appreciating, loving, seeing a kind of interconnectedness. Now the difference exists in order to establish myself as over and against. As something more than, as something more established, more righteous, more holy, more, more worthy of something. Right? And of course, what does Eve have to do? Eve, beginning thrown under the, under the bus, has to find something else to differentiate herself from, right? It wasn't me, but it was the snake. It was the earth, this thing that you gave me, right? And so now, all of a sudden, what do we see in this fallen condition is difference is no longer an orientation of one to the other, but difference is a continuation of violent differentiations, right? where we establish ourselves one over another, almost kind of as, as though the waters are, thump, are filling the room, and all we can do to save ourselves is to step and stomp on the heads below us, right? Someone has to die in order for me to be righteous. And we see this most clearly outside of the garden, in this very first moment as Cain and Abel offer their, offer their sacrifices to God, right? God says to Abel, that's so amazing, that's so wonderful, you knew just what I wanted, that's great, right? Cain brings his, God says, eh, you know, try again next time. So instead of, though, Cain saying, yo, Abel, I need to get my offering game up. How, do we, how can we do this? I need your help, right? How can I, what, what is it that I'm missing? Cain doesn't do that, right? Cain wants to be righteous in the eyes of God. So the only way that Cain can be righteous in the eyes of God is what? To take a rock and smash his brother's head in. Because it's a, if Abel isn't there, then he is the, Cain is the most righteous. Again, a violent differentiation that establishes ourselves over and against rather than bone of bone, flesh of flesh. Now why this long introduction about difference, about bodies. Because in a very real way, we will not understand the question, the distortion, the sin that is racism. Unless we understand first the very sin of differentiation that is a consequence of the fall. And that race is one particular instantiation of this fallenness. One particular instantiation of this violent differentiation that divides us so profoundly. Now what is race and how is it a violent differentiation? The first thing that we have to understand is that race is not really fundamentally about our physical characteristics. 
It actually has nothing to do with that. Race is actually about white people, fundamentally. What do I mean by this? I mean, people, there were Europeans who got off the boat and they saw people who looked different than them, dressed differently, spoke a different language, accounted for life in a different way, just had a completely different order of existence. And these people said, huh, that's weird. How do we make sense of this difference? And these people were Christians. And they said, well, you know what? God made us in the image of God. And that image must have looked a lot like me. Huh. I look in the mirror, right? Go figure. But those people don't look like me. So those people must not be made in the image of God. But if they're not made in the image of God, how can I begin to account for them? And so let's begin to classify all of the ways that they are different than them. Their language, their food, their, their way of building, their means of transport, their history, their language, their lack of language, the way that they marry, the way they raise children, what they eat, all a kind of complicated series of classifications. And the people that eat like this are called such and such. The people that look like this have this skin, this skin color are called such and such. And we see series and series of classifications over and over and over again, all to do what? Not for my benefit benefit, but for the benefit of the one who was doing the classifying. For the benefit of the one who found themselves on the shores of a strange land, didn't know the land, and yet stuck their flag in it anyway. Race is not about our skin color, but race instead is about a process of violent differentiation that establishes the supremacy of whiteness even while making that same whiteness invisible. By naming every difference that it sees and then drawing lines of, signif of significance, lines of capacity, lines of incapacity, lines of criminality, lines of sexuality, lines of sex, lines of promiscuity, upon those bodies, and then because of their guns and because of their economic power, because of their ships, because of their clothes, because of their willingness to kill someone if they did not convert, well, they also had the power to create a society that could make those classifications into something real. In a very real way, they had, the, uh, they had a distorted power of God to make their word incarnate in flesh upon my body. In another day and time, I would have been called a mulatto. The son of a black person and a white person. Again, has nothing to do with me, right? The way that Langston Hughes talks about it in the South, he says the southern sky was, was full of yellow stars. Now why mulatto? Because the, the slave owners could not very well have these children running around with a claim to their plantation, could they? It's not my son. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. So what happens is a, another category, another level of classification gets mapped onto my body in order to establish not that I am black, but more importantly to establish that I am not white. And because I'm not white, I don't have access to education, I don't have access to the vote, I don't have access to certain jobs, I have to live in certain neighborhoods, I don't get the cushy benefit once I fight in the war, right? And so all of a sudden, what begins to happen is this thing we call race has nothing again to do with my skin, but it has all everything to do with the way in which a certain meaning, a certain way of imagining difference has been mapped onto my body, written, inscribed into my very bones and life, and now is part of who I am. And so we live in a fallen world where somehow this fallen, distorted notions of differentiation no longer have to actually operate inside of and alongside individual judgments. Because now we have social systems. We have redlined districts. We have segregated schools. We have any number of means that allow this system of differentiation to self-promulgate, to continue over and over and over again to the point where it then allows us to simply say it's not my fault that they're in such a bad place. They just needed to work hard. 
Because in a sense now it doesn't need to be about an individual because the system does the work of differentiation. The system does the work of sorting. The system does the work of killing, enslaving, throwing into jails so that they might make five cent Walmart Tupperware containers for nothing. Now why am I getting into all of this? Well, we are talking about race. Race is uncomfortable. But what does this mean, though, as Christians? What does it mean to begin to rethink and reimagine these violent differentiations that mark our world and our lives with one another? Well, part of what we begin to see is that when Jesus enters the world, when we think about the word in flesh, that race during this time did not exist, right? Not in the ways that we think about it now, but there were violent differentiations. There were Roman citizens, and there were non-citizens. There were Jews, and there were Gentiles. There were men, there were women, there were slave and free, right? There were all kinds of ways in which societies established and maintained control over one another. In fact, we see in the religious systems that this is one of the facts of the Pharisees. The Pharisees used and, and lived inside of a religious system that was built upon the presumption of some people's defilement, right, and unholiness, and other people's and their own holiness and, um, and, 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 and um, sacredness. And so we see these patterns of violent differentiation over and over and over again. So how then do we begin to understand what Christian life might mean? What does it mean to say that Jesus enters into these violent differentiations and allows us to begin to imagine our life in a new way? Well, the one, first, one thing that we might begin to do is begin to see the way that the very presence of the incarnate word begins to disrupt these violent patterns of differentiation. One of the most profound violent forms of differentiation was the, viola the violence against women. The violence that silenced women's words, that suggested that somehow they did not have a capacity to speak or offer something profound about God's redemptive life and work, right? And yet, what we see in the incarnation, right, is God, as God enunci enunciates to Mary, Mary, you are going to be a child. And Mary says, this is amazing, this is great, let's do this thing, right? Now, one of the things that we oftentimes see in Christian tradition is it uplifts Mary, but it uplifts Mary as an obedient woman whose womb was essentially used for God to kind of pass through, right? And Mary was holy, and Mary was a virgin, and, we, and that was kind of the extent of her life. But I think this is to somehow miss the kind of disruptive power of what it is that God is doing in this moment. Because up to this poem, up, up to this moment in Jewish life, only men could be priests, right? And of course, as a priest, what are you? But you are one who mediates the presence of God. You go into the Holy of Holies, you come out, and as you come out, you are reflective of, you are representative of the God who is hidden, right? So the priest mediates, and only a man could be a priest. And yet, somehow, what we see in the word coming upon Mary, the word abiding in Mary's womb, what does Mary do but literally mediate God's presence into the world? Mediate! She ushers God into the world. She nurtures God in God's womb. She nourishes who God is. And so in a very real way, even just simply in the act of the word becoming flesh, the, the, we see a kind of disruption of this differentiation of what women can or cannot do. But if this were not enough, we also see that Mary doesn't simply say, hey, that sounds cool, use my womb as you will, right? What does she do? She preaches. She says, remember what the promises of God. She quotes Isaiah and she, does all, she goes back into scripture, right? And then she re-articulates that scripture for this current moment. Something that we might call what? Preaching. So not only is Mary the first Christian priest, she is also the first Christian preacher. Because she minds the word of God and brings it up to, my, up to us and reminds us of who God is in this moment. So in this very first moment of the Incarnation, God has already subverted one of the fundamental violent differentiations of what women can or cannot do, simply by becoming a flesh through that particular person. 
But then again, as we begin to follow Jesus' life and ministry, what we begin to see is that this man begins to confuse some people. He confuses people because he uses strange words to refer to himself, like, I am, right? And of course, the I am reference is a reference to, the, to God's name, right? I am who I am. I will be who I will be. And somehow Jesus is using these words to refer to himself. And people are starting to get a little annoyed with this, right? Only God can use those words. And then Jesus says, well, you know, guess what? Not only am I going to use the I am, I'm also going to forgive you for your sins. What? Only God can forgive sins. Only God can see the innermost steps. Only God can judge me, right? Fundamentally for who I am and tell me that I am new. Tell me that I am re redeemed in some way. You can't do that because you're not God. Now, what is it, why is it they, that they could not imagine who this God was? Because their God was hidden. Their God was behind the curtains in the Holy of Holies. If you even caught the slightest glimpse of this God, your face would melt off. There is no way that this man, who we are walking with, who we see eat, who probably poops and farts, it's uncomfortable to say, well, we got to say because he had a body. There's no way that guy's God. Because God is more above us. And so what we see in this very moment, in, these kind of, in this moment, is a second aspect of God's disruptive body. Is while he was also disrupting the lines of male and female, he was also disrupting the lines of creator and creature. What up to that moment the Jews had imagined, God could only be distant, far away, and could not be like us. And yet somehow here was this word enfleshed, walking with us, moving with us, binding and grafting his own body into our own bodies, our own life into his life. And so God transgresses and disrupts by becoming like us. One of my favorite Karl Barth um, lines, um, I use it in almost all of my talks, is to say that God chooses not to be God without us. God chooses not to be God without us. And so what we begin to see is that in the transgression of the male-female, in the transgression of the creator, the creature, what do we begin to see but a slow bending, a slow redemption of what difference might be. Right? What is the difference? The difference is not that it is understood alone. The, differ the power of a difference made in the image of God is the difference is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And that in each one of these moments of Jesus' life, starting with the incarnation, moving into his ministry, what is he doing? But in every aspect of his life is simply saying, I choose not to be me without you. I choose not to be me without you. You are bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But in order to do that, what does he have to do? But he has to push through the walls that have divided. The walls of the violent differentiations that have rendered some people unholy and other people holy. And so what does he do? But he walks and he moves and he takes the Jews and the Jews are finally saying, look, this is great. We got the rabbi, we got the Messiah. Look, at who, look who we are now. Right? You know, I just imagine Peter, like a fisherman his whole life, right? Right? Kind of getting stabbed at, getting like, kind of poor, or whatever. But now he's got the rabbi. He's all walking with Jesus. I'm with him. I'm a Jew. Look, look, who, look who's a Jew now. Right? And all of a sudden, what does Jesus do? He takes him into the tax collector's house. Peter's like, no, nah, man, that's not, that's not what I'm about. I'm a Jew. Do you know what he did? Do you know what people like him did to me? I thought I thought we were gonna I thought we were about I thought we were about Jewish purity, Jesus. I thought we were about taking this whole thing back. But then what did what is Jesus saying to Peter? Peter says, No, this man is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Because you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, you are bone of his bone. In his flesh. 
And what we see in Jesus' life is a kind of slow immersion, a submersion into the very waters of what it means to be human being. And all of a sudden, if you follow Jesus, you will, inev you will inevitably go to where the lepers go are. You will inevitably go to where the prostitutes are. You will inevitably go to where the Roman soldiers are. You will go to all of those places where it was once imagined to be the polar opposite of what it meant to be a good Jew. And yet in that moment, what is Jesus doing but saying, they are part of who I am? What's that verse in Ephesians? It says, he comes to those who are far and, those, and comes to those who are near. And then doing so begins to draw them more closely into one another. Until finally there is difference and there is likeness. There is difference that is only understood as being bound to the life of the one who is not us, but is somehow like us. And so when we begin to think about Jesus' life, this disruptive body, he makes no sense. He is on the one hand a body that is divine, on the other hand a body that is flesh. Right? He is one who is all-knowing and he is one who does not know the day or the hour. In a very real way, he simply does not fit the categories that human, human beings had for him. That's why when you get to the definition of Chalcedonus, people are trying to figure out who this Jesus is. How do we describe him? They, they, only, they have to resort to negations. They say is he's simply fully God and fully man without confusion, without separation, without division. None of those things even make sense together, right? But they, well, in a sense, what are, what are they simply saying is that he is who he is. But in him being who he is, he also disrupts all of those violent differentiations that allowed me to think about who I was as who I was as long as I was not them. So to follow Jesus is to follow the disruption. To follow a body that slowly draws us into the lives and the stories of those that we once thought were the polar opposite of who we were. It draws us into not only the lives of the people, but it also draws us into danger. Because we live inside of a system that is built upon these violent differentiations, that retains its power through the violent differentiations. And so as Jesus welcomes the tax collector, and he welcomes the Syrophoenician woman, and he welcomes the carpenter, and he welcomes the centurion, what begins to happen? But he begins to catch the attention of some people. And they begin to say, wait a second, how will we know who is holy and who is not? If you keep dividing these lines, how will we know who is a citizen and who is not? If you keep drawing all of these people into your life, what is this new thing, this new creature that you are creating? We don't know how to make sense of it. God, we don't have the eyes to understand this difference that you're giving us. It makes no sense to us. And so what happens is that those begin to plot against Jesus. Womanist and feminist interpreters of scripture and theologians have given us a very important distinction about Jesus' death. They have suggested that no, Jesus did not have to die. Jesus did not have to die to forgive our sins. Now this might make not make some much sense in terms of this notion of sacrifice and God requiring blood in order to make us new. In essence, what they're saying is that God, Jesus did not have to die, but he chose a life where he knew he would be killed. He chose a life that lived into these violent differentiations in such a way that he began to threaten those who had power, began to threaten those who had wealth, began to threaten those whose livelihoods depended upon the, 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 the maintenance of these differentiations. And so they begin to plot against him. But even in that moment, what does Jesus do but lives into the moment of abuse, lives into the moment of isolation, until even in his very last breath, his body is doing work. Because we can say that in that moment, God took even death into God's own life. That we can truly say that our God is one who was dead. 
And because of this, there is no place that God has not gone in order to be with us. There is no length, no, there is no place that we can be where God has not already met us. There is no difference in our life, in our existence, that has not been broken down so that we might be with God and so that God might be with us. But if this is the case, we might also have to ask ourselves in a moment of profound racial polarization, why is it so easy for us to maintain a life that enjoys the benefits of those differences? Why do we remain satisfied with notions of Christian identity that allow these walls to be, to main, to be maintained? Why do we follow Jesus not into the corners and crevices, but only into the places that make us comfortable? I think one of the things that we have to begin to ask ourselves as we begin to think about what Christian life looks like in a raced world is that we have to begin to account for how race is, again, not simply about our, the color of our skin, but race is really about an edifice of power. It is about an imagination that allows some people to think themselves self-sufficient. That allows to think for themselves that everything might be possible and should be possible for them. Because they earned it, because they worked hard, because they simply exist. And when they are confronted by someone who says, no, a little bit more of your money needs to go for this. A little bit more of your time needs to go for that. You need to slow, yourself, slow your curriculum down a little bit for the sake of these people. You need to read some different books. You need to not use these names. You need to begin to question the, the reality of criminality and who gets named criminal and who doesn't. You say, whoa, hold on a second. But in fact, that very place where you feel most uncomfortable, where you feel most unsure, when you might, that tiny little question starts to come into your mind, and you say, wait a second, if that is true, if they get in, if they have that, what about me? Who am I then? I would contend that our moment of divisiveness, of polarization, has nothing to do with divisiveness and polarization. It has nothing to do with two different sides that are equally the same. Our moment of violence has to do with a, an account of reckoning. And a, a reckoning that's where we have people who are rising up and saying simply, it's so simple, our lives matter. We should not be shot in the street like dogs. We should have due process. If I steal a bag of chips, I shouldn't have to go to jail for three years while a millionaire can afford a lawyer that allows him to do, to do six months probation for tax evasion. It shouldn't be that hard. And yet, what is white supremacy? White supremacy is a social imagination that presumes that certain people should have the right to do whatever they want. So much so that when someone stands up and simply says, our lives matter, it is an affront. It is violence. It is shocking. It is dismaying. And they say, you don't know who you are. Why are you nothing but a terrorist? Why don't you talk more calmly? All I'm saying is I shouldn't be shot. All I'm saying is I should have equal access to education. All I'm saying is that perhaps I shouldn't get thrown in jail for a minor offense just because of the, skin, the color of my skin. That's not offensive. But in a, so, in a society where violent differentiation has become actually the norm, those who shout Black Lives Matter become an affront. They become disruptive. Because what are they doing but they're saying that my body matters, my life matters. I want you to see me for who I am and what my story is. So as we begin to think about this question of race 
and faith, the race and Christianity, as we go to worship in churches from Sunday to Sunday, and we partake in the Eucharist, or we hear the word preached, we have to ask ourselves, who is being preached? Is, is, who is being preached? The disruptive God who goes to the houses of tax collectors and says, you are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? Or do we worship a domesticated God who lets us feel comfortable in our own skin? Who reminds us it's okay who you are. Just stay the same. Nurture that little soul inside of yourself and everything will be all right. Perhaps that God allows us to be in the bushes, covered with fig leaves, pretending our blindness is sight. But I pray as we begin to imagine a world of, a world of the future, that we might begin to think about this disruptive body, this Jewish man, and just how dangerous following him might be, both for us and for this world that we live in. Tomorrow I'll ask, this question, I'll ask the question, what does it mean to be saved? Is it possible that salvation is a song? And here I want us to begin to think about salvation, about redeem, redeemed life, as less of a geographic reality, as a place that has come somewhere hereafter that we are kind of slowly earning our way towards. But perhaps salvation already came. Perhaps salvation already exists in the pattern of life, in the very body that Jesus lived and lived into us. And perhaps salvation is a song where we sing with that God. We sing with our lives. And when perhaps that means our own kinds of disruptions. We'll see. Thank you very much. The uh, tradition of T.B. Masson was to move from scripture to ethical thinking about how we should live as Jesus lived. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bantam, for providing a new and fresh example of that very model of reading scripture, of hearing from scripture how we are called to live in our day. Uh, your words are beautiful and painful and challenging and full of life. Thank you so much. We look forward to tomorrow. Logston Seminary and uh, the T.B. Masson Foundation established years ago uh, the possibility of uh, focusing on young scholars at the various uh, universities of Texas Baptists. And uh, the Young Masson Scholar Program invites uh, the faculty of the Texas Baptist University to select two individuals among uh, their company students who show excellence in academics and an interest in ethics and nominate them as young Maston scholars. And then they come to campus and the foundation and we help provide an opportunity of a retreat and participation in these lectures and conversations together. And uh, we are so honored by the presence of uh, you, this uh, this group of wonderful 2019 Young Maston Scholars, we recognize your achievements and uh, we uh, are so grateful that you're in our presence. I want to uh, introduce each of these uh, remarkable young people to you uh, and ask you to uh, come forward. Dr. Wernz will be here in the uh, center uh, of uh, the room uh, with a gift for you, a certificate and uh, a book by uh, Dr. Mastin to present to you and if you'll pause there just a moment, a photographer will snap a picture uh, and then we'll get that picture to you and your mom and dad and your faculty and your hometown newspaper, wherever you would like for it to go uh, so that we might uh, extend this uh, celebration of the, the good work that you, you have uh, done. Um, let me ask, is our photographer here? Are you here? No. Yes. Okay. Good. Coming. Very good. We have uh, two individuals who have uh, come to us 
as uh, Mass and Scholars this year from the uh, Baptist University of the Americas. Uh, one of those is uh, David Morga. And also from BUA is Javier Sanchez. And uh, from Dallas Baptist University, Jessica Farnell. And also from DBU, Gracie Michael. From East Texas uh, Baptist University, Lane Craig. And also from ETBU, Jared Gann. From Howard Payne University, we welcome Caitlin Bush. And also uh, from Howard Payne, Joel Justice. From Hardin-Simmons University, uh, we have Zach Dean. And also from Hardin-Simmons, Nathan McKendry. From University of Mary Hardin Baylor, we welcome Ryan McKissick. And also from UMHB, Ashlyn Wimberly. And uh, finally, from Wayland Baptist University, Shelby Stefan. And from Wayland, Riley Williams. Would you like to congratulate them? We will be uh, concluding in just a few minutes, and I would like to ask all of you young Mass and Scholars, when we have finished with the benediction, if you'll come up here on the steps, and we'll ask our photographer to take a, a group picture uh, that we may, may have. In the foyer, you'll find uh, that there are some books uh, by uh, Dr. Bantam that are available, and you may want to avail the opportunity of purchasing those. As a reminder, our second lecture in the series is tomorrow at 9.30 in uh, Barron's uh, Chapel, uh, University Chapel time. And uh, some of you have made reservations for lunch tomorrow, and at lunchtime, which will be in Moody Center 108, uh, then Dr. Bantam will also engage in some conversation uh, with us. When we finish tonight, just across the, the foyer in the reception room, we have some refreshments for you. So we look forward to an opportunity of, uh, of fellowship together as we finish. Leading us uh, in our benediction tonight is uh, Dr. Meredith Stone. May I lead us in our benediction tonight? <laughs> our gracious God, for this wonderful world you have made, we give you thanks. For the opportunity 
of celebrating incarnation in so many different and wonderful directions. We give you thanks for the difference and the likeness of Imago Dei. We give you thanks. May we learn how to be the faithful creatures of you, our great God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.